Hello and happy Wednesday, May 13th. We are going to finish Liddy today. It has been uh, forever long, it seems, drawing out the reading of this book, but we will finally have it finished today. So we are going to read chapters 22 and 23, and then you are going to have the questions on ESB for chapters 22 and 23. This will just be one assignment put together. You have five questions from chapter 22, five questions from chapter 23. So your learning target is I can answer text dependent questions from chapter 22 and 23. So just as a recap, remember at the end of chapter 21, Liddy gets dismissed. She is fired because of moral turpitude. She has no clue what this means. And to be honest, I had never heard that word before reading this book, because we don't really talk like this much anymore. This is kind of an old school word that you would use. So we kind of didn't really know why she's getting fired. Mr. Morrison says she's a troublemaker and the agent takes his word for it. She can't really even stand up for herself when she gets fired. And she also doesn't get an honorable discharge. So she can't go anywhere else, can't go work at any other corporation in Massachusetts. So we have no clue what is going to happen to her after she's fired. So we'll find out with chapters 22 and 23. So let's go ahead and go to that book. And I'm gonna start with chapter 23, or er, 22, excuse me. It is titled Farewell, okay? So here we go. The bear had won. It had stolen her home, her family, her work, her good name. She had thought she was so strong, so tough, and she had just stood there like a day-old lamb and let it gobble her down. She looked around the crowded room that had been her home, the two double beds squeezed in with less than a foot between them for passage. She thought of Betsy sitting cross-legged on the one, bent slightly toward the candle, reading aloud while she, Liddy, lay motionless lost in Oliver's world. And Amelia, Amelia would know what tur turpentine, turpentine, whatever the wretched word was, Amelia was sure to know what it meant. She could see the older girl's eyebrows arch and her lips purse. But why are you asking? Indeed, so I can know what, what they charged against me, why I've lost my job, why I've been dismissed without a certificate. You? Betsy would laugh. Not our Liddy, Mr. Marston's best girl. Meanwhile, Prudence would be busy explaining the meaning of the cuss word. Thank God Rachel was safe. She had a home and food and school. She had a mother and Charlie. I will not cry. She began to pack her things, stuffing them unfolded into the tiny gunny sack that had been her only luggage when she came. She almost laughed aloud. The sack wouldn't hold her extra clothes, much less her books. Well, she was a rich woman now. She could afford a proper trunk for her belongings, even if she had no place to take them. They let me go, she explained to Mrs. Bedlow. The landlady was incredulous. But why, she asked. You were Mr. Marsden's best girl. Everyone said so. Liddy gave a laugh, more like a horse whinny than any human sound. Then everyone is wrong. She could not bring herself to describe to Mrs. Bedlow the two encounters in the weaving room. She must somehow have caused the first. She knew so little of the ways of men and women that she must have, without realizing, given him some sign. Mr. Marsden was a deacon in his church. He was not a likable man, but surely... And last night, mercy on her, she'd acted like a crazed beast. Why, even her own mother who died in an asylum had never gone wild like that. She did not like Mr. Marsden. She had never liked him, but she had tried to please him, tried to win his approval by being the best. And though she needed to know what it was exactly that he was accusing her of, she knew he had not told the agent of those encounters. So it was something else she had done wrong. She would have asked Mrs. Bedlow, but she was afraid the word would come out turpentine and Mrs. Bedlow would laugh. She couldn't bear to be laughed at, not just now. I'll be out of my room by tomorrow, the next day at the latest. But where will you go? Don't worry for me, I can't stand it if you are kind, I might break down. Back to housekeeping, I reckon. That was it, Trifina would be sure to take her in. She went to the bank and withdrew all her money, $243.87. Let me pause there for, for a second. By the way, $243 is actually um, in 2020, 
uh, today's time, that's about eight grand, so $8,000. So $8,000 nowadays, she'd be walking away with that. That's a good chunk of change. That's a pretty decent amount of money for you to be walking away with. You got a good savings um, under your belt. So even though it only sounds like it's not a lot, $243, remember this is in 1846. So with inflation and everything today, that'd be about $8,000 that she's walking away with, okay? So let's keep going. Then she went to the bookstore. <clears throat> oh, let me... <clears throat> Excuse me. She wanted to give Bridget a copy of Oliver Twist, even if the girl couldn't really read it yet. She'd be able to in time. Would there be anything else for you today, Miss Morthen? They were friends now, the bookseller and she. She hesitated. What did it matter? She would never be in again. Do you have a book that, that tells the meanings of words? Ah, he said. We have an old Alexander dictionary, of course, and then there's Webster's and Worcester's, which are more up to date. I think I need a up-to-date one, she said. She didn't want to risk buying one that didn't have the one word she needed. The bookseller got down two fat books, parts one and two of An American Dictionary of the English Language, and then a third. Many people prefer the Worcester, he said, indicating the third book. It's a bit newer and all in the one volume. Lady paid for the Worcester and forced herself to take it out of the shop before opening it. As soon as she was out of sight of the bookshop window, she rested her parcels on the sidewalk and opened the dictionary. It took her some time to find the word. The pages were thin and her fingers calloused and clumsy, and she did not know the spelling, but she found it at last. What? She could have howled in the street had it not been so crowded with passers-by. She was not a vile or shameful character. She was not base or depraved. She was only ignorant, and what was the sin in that? He was the evil one to accuse her of such. She had done nothing evil, only foolish. She rushed back to her room. What could she do? The damage was done. If only she had known what was going on when she was in the agent's office, how that vile man was lying. Oh, the agent was quick to believe him. When I cried out, it was I who was made to seem in the wrong. I was unladylike. That was my crime. She wrote the letters in a fury, burning herself with sealing wax, her hand was shaking so. She rushed out of the house, her bonnet ribbons loose, her shawl flying. By the time she got to the acre, she was out of breath and could hardly ask the children playing in the streets where Bridget's house might be. The first child she asked looked up with wide, frightened eyes and ran away without speaking. She stood long enough to tie her bonnet properly and catch her breath before asking another. He pointed dumbly to a shack that turned out not to be Bridget's house at all, but the housewife inside knew Bridget and gave Liddy proper directions. Bridget herself answered the door. Oh, Liddy, what have they done? I'm dismissed, Liddy said. No, it cannot be. It can't be helped. It's done. But they must not dismiss you. I've already written a letter to Mr. Marsden. I told him if he dismisses you or dismissed you or bothered you in any way, I would tell his wife exactly what happened in the weaving room. Now, here is the letter addressed to her. If there's any problem, you must mail it at once. Bridget stared at her mouth open. At once, you must swear to me you will. The girl nodded. And now, I'd like to sit down if I could. Oh, I'm terrible rude. Bridget stepped aside and let her into the tiny shack. The smell was strong of food and body sweat. It was dark, but Liddy could see children's eyes large and staring. Me mother's house cleaning today. Bridget picked up a pile of what looked like rags, but might have been clothing, off a rough stool, and Liddy sat down gratefully. She was still tired from last night, tired as she had been after her sickness, her bones aching with it. Thank you, she said. Where will you be going? Not far from here, I hope. They didn't give me a certificate, so I have to go. And it's all me fault. No, you mustn't blame yourself. There was no place else to sit except the bed, so Bridget stood watching her. In the darkness of the room, the only noise was the rustle of the children shifting, staring. She had stopped gasping for breath. It was time to leave. I'll be going, Bridget. Oh yes, I nearly forgot. She handed the girl the parcel containing Bridget's old primer and Oliver Twist. So you won't forget me altogether, eh? She said, and fled so she wouldn't have to listen to Bridget's sobs. That evening, just at the closing bell, she made her way down the street beyond the boarding house row to the trim frame houses of the overseers of the Concord Corporation. She didn't know which house was his, but it didn't matter. He would have to come this way. She stood in the shadow of the first house and waited.
There was no mistaking his walk. Like a little bantam rooster, he came all alone. Does he have any friends at all? She shoved the thought aside. She mustn't let anything dilute her anger. Mr. Marsden? She stepped out of the shadow and stood in his path. He stopped, alarmed. They were nearly the same height, and she stood close to his face and spoke with deadly quiet, the long brim of her bonnet nearly brushing his cheeks. Yes, it's me, Lydia Worthen. Miss Worthen, he breathed out her name. I am mean and I am cheap. Sometimes I am a coward and oftentimes I'm selfish. I ain't a beauty to look at, but I am not vile, shameful, base, or depraved. What? You accuse me of moral turpitude, Mr. Marsden. I am here to say I am not guilty. He stepped backward with a little puff of a gasp. I have here a letter I wrote. I will tell you what it says. It says, if you cause Bridget McBride to lose her position, I will see that your wife is informed about what really happens in the weaving room after hours. My wife, he whispered. Mrs. Overseer Marsden, I figure she ought to know if there is moral turpitude occurring in her husband's weaving room. She jammed the letter in the overseer's hand and closed his reluctant fist around it. Good night, Mr. Marsden. I hope you sleep easy before you die. She took a stage to Boston. Now this is a stagecoach, remember what she rode to Lowell in? She took a stage to <coughs> Boston. <coughs> Excuse me. Hardly anyone did these days. The train was so much faster, but she had nowhere to go in such a hurry and the ride gave her time to compose herself. Boston was a terrible place, older and even dirtier and more crowded than Lowell. The streets were narrow, and Liddy stepped gingerly around the refuse and animal droppings, lifting her skirt with one hand and trying to balance her new trunk under the other arm. She should have found a safe place to leave it, but how did one do that in an unknown city? At last, she found the address. She looked through a glass window door and saw Diana herself, tall and pale, but no longer thin. She was speaking to a customer, her head slightly bent toward the short woman, woman a polite smile on her face. Liddy shifted the heavy trunk, under her left arm and pushed open the door. A bell rang and Diana looked up at the sound. At first, she nodded politely, her attention still with the chattering customer. Then she recognized Liddy and her face was transformed. Excuse me a moment, she said to the woman and came over and took the trunk. Liddy, her voice was still quiet and beautifully low pitched. How wonderful to see you. There was no time to talk until the customer's order was complete and the bell rang signaling her departure. How are you, Liddy? Diana asked. They dismissed me, she said, for moral turpitude. For what? Diana was almost laughing. It means, I know what it means, Diana said gently. I'm intimately acquainted with the term myself, but you, surely, you were not vile, base, or depraved, Liddy said. Thank you. Diana tried not to smile, but the corners of her mouth betrayed her. And neither are you. What I can't imagine is how it was Mr. Marsden. Ah, yes, dear Mr. Marsden. When Liddy told the whole story, nearly crying again in her rage, she realized suddenly that Diana was shaking with laughter. It weren't funny, eh? She protested. No, no, of course not. I'm sorry, but I'm imagining his face when you pounced out at him last night, just when he thought he'd won, when he'd rid himself so neatly of the evidence. Liddy saw the rosebud mouth shaped into an O of fright. It was satisfying, wasn't it? And his wife is a perfect terror, but you know that. I didn't think anyone else would believe me against him. Oh, she's a terror, all right. Everyone says so. She's a fright, I promise you. She got up and poured them each a cup of tea. Let's celebrate, shall we? Oh, Lydia, it's so good of you to come. How can I help you? But she had come to help Diana. I thought, I thought to help you if I could. Thank you, but I'm doing all right, as you can see. It was hard at first. No one seemed to want a husbandless woman expecting a child, but the proprietress here was ill and desperate for help, so we needed one another. It's worked out well. She's been so kind, and her daughter will look out for the baby when it comes. She smiled happily, like family to me. She reached over and patted Liddy's knee, but you understand. Liddy spent the night with Diana. Everyone was kind. Diana had her family at last. Then why had something snapped like a broken warp thread inside Liddy's soul? Wasn't she happy for Diana? Surely, surely she was, happy and greatly relieved. You must write to Bridget and tell her you are fine, eh? 
Lydia said as they parted the next morning. She can read now and she worries. It rained all the way through New Hampshire, a steady wearying drizzle. Lydia rode inside the coach. There was only one other passenger, an old man who took no notice of her. She was grateful because she cried most of the way. She, tough as gristle Liddy, her face in her handkerchief, her head turned toward the shaded window. But the tumult that had raged inside her damped down more and more, as though beat into the muddy earth under the horse's hooves. When they finally crossed the bridge into Vermont, the sun came out and turned the leafless trees into silver against the deep green of the evergreen on the mountain slopes. The air was clean and cold, the sky blue, more like a bright day at winter's end than November. Okay, let's continue on with chapter 23. So she's going back to Vermont, her home, in November of 1846. One more night along the way, and the sky had turned into the underside of a thick quilt. The coachman pressed the team, eager to get to the next stop before the snow began to fall. It was nearly dusk when the coach took the final dash around the curb in the road that had brought it to the door of Cutler's Tavern. Nothing had changed except herself. At first, Trifina pretended not to recognize her at all. This grand lady come from the city of looms and spindles. But soon the game was over and the old cook gave her a warm embrace and drew her to a seat by the giant fireplace. I would have thought you'd have a cook stove by now, Liddy said, half teasing as she looked around the familiar kitchen. Not while I'm cook here, Trifina said fiercely. I reckon everyone has those monstrosities in the city, eh? They work fine. We had one at the boarding house. Trifina sniffed. They'll do, maybe, for those who ain't real cooks. She handed Liddy a cup of her boiled coffee, thick with cream and maple sugar. So for your for a visit home, eh? Liddy was brought back with a pang to her present state. I've left the factory, she said, for good. So it's back to the farm, is it? My uncle sold it. But what of your poor mother and the little ones? Mama died, Liddy said. There was no need to tell Trifina where. And baby Agnes as well. Oh dear, said Trifina softly. So Charlie took Rachel to live with him at the mill. The Finneys have been good to them both, so she took a long drink from her coffee. It scalded her throat, but she shook off the pain of it. So for the first time, I'm a free woman, not a care, not a care in the world. She paused, not knowing how to say then that she wished therefore to become once more a housemaid in Mistress Cutler's tavern. So I thought to myself, what fun to work with Trifina again. The cook threw her head back and laughed. She thinks I'm joking. How to explain? How to say I have nowhere else to go? And then the girl came in. She was no more than 12 or 13, dressed in rough calico with ill-fitting boots. Liddy's heart sank. That was the housemaid. There was no room for her at Cutler's Tavern anymore. As it was, she spent the night in one of the guest rooms, paying full price, although Mistress Cutler pretended for a moment that she couldn't possibly take payment from an old and valued employee. Liddy lay awake, wondering at the silence outside the window, the only light, the cloud-veiled moon. How could you sleep in such a quiet place with no rhythm and clatter from the street? Nothing at all to distract your head from wondering what on earth you could do, where you could go, in a world that had no place for you, no need for you at all. Then you're off to see the children today, said Trifina, as she fed her breakfast at the great children, great kitchen table. Liddy was grateful to have plans for at least one day. The snow is no more on a dusting. I can get Henry to take you in the wagon. Henry was Willie's successor. Liddy chose to walk. The day was cold and clear, but her shawl was warm and her boots stout and well broken in. She was at the mill by mid-morning. Mrs. Finney greeted her kindly, but Charlie and Rachel were gone to school in the village, so she just kept walking, her feet taking her up the hill road, past the fields and pastures of Quaker Stevens's farm, and on, up and beyond, until she rounded the last curve and saw it sitting there, squat and homely against the green and silver of the November mountain. A tracery of snow lay on the fields and in the yard, but it was not true winter yet. In a week or so, everything would be sleeping under a thick comforter, but for now, the cabin stood out in all its sturdy homemade ugliness. Just like me, she thought, and blinked back tears. It was good to be home. There was no wood piled against the door. Someone had stacked it neatly again in the woodshed. The door itself had been repaired and fit snugly now into its frame. She raised her father's wooden latch and pushed it open. Even at the brightest midday, it was never really light inside the cabin. On a November afternoon, it was truly dark. 
She found the flint box, no sulfur matches here, and lit the neatly laid tinder and logs. It was as though someone had prepared for her coming. She pulled her mother's rocker close and stared into the flames. Nothing smelled so good or danced so well as a birch fire. It was so full of cheer, so welcoming. Liddy stretched her toes out toward the warmth of it and sighed, nearly content. She could almost forget everything. She was home where she had longed to be. Perhaps she could just stay the night here. No one would care. How could they deny her just one night before she left forever? Liddy? She jumped up. There was the shape of a man bent over low so as to clear the doorway. He stepped into the cabin and straightened tall. Liddy? He said again, and she knew him for Luke Stevens. She was more angry at the interruption than ashamed to be caught. Liddy, he said a third time, is it thee? He took off his broad Quaker hat and held it over his stomach, squinting a little to see her through the darkness. I meant no harm, she said. I just come to say goodbye. It sounded silly as she said it, coming to say goodbye to a cabin. Mother thought she saw thee pass. She sent me to fetch thee for supper and to stay the night, if thee will. She wished she could ask him just to let her stay here for this one night, but there was no food and she had no right to use up the Stevens's kindling. She would not be beholden to them more than she could help. I'll just be going back. Please, he said, stay with us. The dark comes so quick this time of year. Her pride fought with her empty belly, but the truth was it had been hours since Trifina's breakfast and the walk back would be long and dark and cold. I've no wish to impose. Thee must not think so, he said quickly. It would be pleasure, it would pleasure our mother to have another woman in the house, he smiled shyly. She often complains that none of us boys can seem to find a woman who will have us. He came to the fireplace and knelt to separate the logs and put out her small fire. She was glad his back was to her, and there was no chance that he could see her face flush red in the shadowy light of the cabin. About your letter, she began. He shook his head without turning it to turning to her. It was a foolish hope, he said quietly. I pray thee forgive me. They walked side by side down the road, the sun a blazing pumpkin, as it fell rapidly behind the western mountains. Luke's long legs purposefully shortened their stride so that she would not have to skip to keep up. For a long time, neither spoke, but as the sun disappeared and the dusk began to gather about them, he set his gaze far down the road ahead and asked softly, Then if they will not stay, where will they go? I'm off, she said, and knew as she spoke what it was she was off to, to stare down the bear, the bear that she had thought all these years was outside herself, but now truly knew was in her own narrow spirit. She would stare down all the bears. She stopped in the middle of the road, her whole body alight with the thrill of it. I'm off, she said, to Ohio. There's a college there that will take a woman just like a man. The plan grew as she spoke. First, I must go tomorrow to say goodbye to Charlie and little Rachel, and then I'll take the coach to Concord. And from there, she took a deep breath. The train. I'll go all the rest of the way by train. He watched her face as though trying to read her thoughts, but gave up the attempt. He is indeed a wonder, Lady Worthen, he said. She looked up into his earnest face as he leaned to speak to her and saw in his bent shoulders the shade of an old man in a funny broad Quaker hat, the gentle old man that he would someday become and that she would love. Darnation, Liddy Worthen, ain't you learned nothing? Don't you know better than to tie yourself to some other living soul? You'd only be asking for trouble and grief. Might as well just throw open the cabin door full wide and invite that black bear right onto the hearth. Still, if he was to wait, he was looking right at her, his head cocked, his brown eyes questioning. His face was so close she could see a trace of soot on it, like Charlie. The boy could never mess with a fire without getting all dirty. She held her hand tightly to her side to keep from reaching up and wiping his cheek with her fingers. Will you wait, Luke Stevens? It'll be years before I come back to these mountains again. I won't come back weak and beaten down and because I have nowhere else to go. No, I will not be a slave, even to myself. Do I frighten thee? He asked gently. Eh? Thee was staring at me something fierce. She began to giggle as she used to when she and Charlie had been young. His solemn face crinkled into lines of puzzlement, and then, still not understanding, he crumpled into laughter, as though glad to be infected by her merriment. He took off his broad hat and ran his big hand through his rusty hair. I will miss thee, he said. We can still hop, Luke Stevens, Liddy said.
but not allowed. Alrighty, so that is the end of Liddy. Uh, we're going to do more activities next week with it, but this is the final chapter questions that you're going to have to do. So once you finish this video, I want you to go into Edsby and I want you to find the chapter 22 and 23 comprehension questions. There are 10. They're divided into chapter 22 for the first five questions and chapter 23 for the last five questions. So let me read through them uh, really quick for you. And then once this video is over, you need to go back and do those 10 questions. Okay, so question one says, Liddy bought a dictionary and finally found out what moral turpitude meant. What was Mr. Marsden accusing her of? So basically, I want you to tell me what moral turpitude means. She read it in the dictionary. Question two, how does Liddy protect Bridget before she leaves Lowell? So what does Liddy do that would be a, a good thing for Bridget that's protecting her? She gives Bridget something. Question three says, when Liddy meets Mr. Marsden in the street, she hands him the letter that she wrote as blackmail. She even says, good night, Mr. Marsden. I hope you sleep easy before you die. What does this encounter tell you about the kind of friend and person Liddy is? Because she's being a friend to Bridget by doing this, but then it also tells you, you know, about her as a person. So I want you to tell me the character traits that you would use to describe her. And I want you to pick two character traits off of this picture that I included for you. Okay, so if you click the picture, it gets bigger and you can kind of see that it's broken into different categories. So if you think that maybe this shows that she's a nice friend or mean or she's sad or she's confident, nervous, positive, negative, then look under those categories and that can kind of help you figure out what um, character traits to use. So I want you to pick two there. So that question is worth two points. Question four says, why does Liddy go to see Diana in Boston? So she travels to Boston, sees Diana, why does she go? Uh, five, when Liddy's in the stagecoach on her way back to Vermont, she cries most of the way. Is this behavior what you would expect from Liddy? So her crying most of the way in the stagecoach, is this something that Liddy maybe would have done in the past? Or is this something that is like her at all? So that's just a yes or no. And there is a correct answer there. Okay, and then chapter 23. Question one says, why does Liddy return to the tavern? So she goes back to Cutler's Tavern. Why, what's her reason for going? And why does she go back to the cabin? She doesn't own it anymore. Nobody of her family lives there, so why would she wanna go back there? Then who surprised Liddy at the cabin? So who was there? I need a name. And that's a, you know, the computer's grading that one, so I need the full name there. Um, when Liddy says, question four, when Liddy says, will you wait, Luke Stevens? What is she talking about? Wait for what? So what does she mean? She doesn't actually say this out loud, but she thinks it in her head. Will you wait, Luke Stevens? So what is she talking about? And then question five, what plan does Liddy make for herself and her future? So this is what she's going to, her plan, okay? All right, so there are 10 questions for chapter 22 and 23. That's what you need to get done. Um, and remember, the Liddy book is available to you. It is found in the library of your reading class page, okay? So make sure that you are going to the reading class page. Let me go ahead and save this just in case I didn't already. Make sure when you're going into your reading page on your main class, I'll just pick on first period. When you go to the reading page, that library is all the way on the right side, okay? The Liddy book is there for you to go back to at any point. You can also go back to this video and rewind, drag and drop, okay? This lesson will be in the weekly lessons for May 11th through May 15th, because that is this week. Every other week lessons are in here. So if you're missing any other assignments, you can be clicking in there and finding the lesson to help you complete the assignment, okay? So all you need to do is chapter 22 and chapter 23 questions for Wednesday. All right, have a wonderful Wednesday.